This is our third CPD webinar presented by Ian Killock. He's our heating sales engineer at Daikin. Uh, Ian will be talking about Daikin's air to water heat pumps, how they work, efficiencies and benefits. Um, Ian has worked in the renewable energy industry for almost two decades with a huge passion for climate change and low energy building. He's worked on projects internationally, including Nigeria, Germany and Sweden. Ian is dedicated to helping Ireland reach its climate action goals by 2030 and beyond with sustainable construction and living. So over to you, Ian. Thanks, Andrew. Share a screen here. Give me a second here and I'll now share the screen here. So, Welcome everybody. I hope you can see my screen um, and you can all hear me. Thank you very much for joining us here today. Thanks, Andrew, for the introduction. And Brian and Lisa in the background. Um, I'm just going to give you uh, an introduction to heat pumps. This is really what this presentation is. And uh, my name is Ian Killock. As Andrew said, I have a lot of experience at this end of it, a number of years in renewables. And um, I'm just going to give you a brief introduction to Daikin, for those of you who don't know us as a, as a company. We're the largest heat pump manufacturer in the world. We don't make uh, anything other than heat pumps, chillers, and air conditioning systems. And we're a Japanese multinational started in 1924. We introduced the first heat pump our heat pump packaged air, uh, air conditioner 51, but first packaged heat pump was developed in 1958 by us. Um, where our headquarters is in Belgium, uh, in Europe. That's our European headquarters. We have 14 manufacturing plants in Europe. And um, over the years, we've done a lot of new innovations within the heat pump industry and air conditioning industry. You might have heard uh, R32 as a refrigerant. That's the latest developments within the um, technology of heat pumps. And um, we invented this refrigerant over 20 years ago. And uh, it's two thirds cleaner for global warming. If there was ever a refrigerant leak, or if anyone cut a pipe, etc., anything like that. And we introduced, we were very, very proud to be the fact that Wexford County Council were the first to install R32 heat pumps back in 2017-2018 as part of an ENSA project with um, Three Counties Energy Agency, etc. So there's been a lot of developments and all since then. We're into this year now and things are moving forward as again. We're always seeing somebody developing the industry, etc. What you see in front of you is the infinity symbol. It means we can do anywhere from heating from uh, minus 45 degrees to uh, infinity, so into uh, district heating systems, etc. We're aiming for zero CO2 emissions by 2050. We're already in a program, we started a year of um, re renewing the refrigerants, in other words, taking the old refrigerant from out of older air con and heat pump systems and um, mixing that with a new virgin um, refrigerant and putting that into our systems. It means it's redeveloping the whole thing. It's a, it's a continuous cycle. So nothing is wasted or going into the atmosphere. And um, this is a big, big step forward. And hopefully other companies will come on and start doing that in a number of years. 70, 77,000 people working with. So we've um, a lot of support out there and we're uh, in over 150 countries. That's just some of our predict production bases worldwide. And so we make everything in Europe to meet compliance here in Ireland and other countries in Europe. So everything is Eurovent certified and meeting uh, the building codes here in, in Ireland. What makes us a little bit unique as a manufacturer is we're the only manufacturer that makes our own compressor and we make the refrigerant that goes into it. So we supply a lot of air, other air con manufacturers around the world with the refrigerants. And, uh, and we, in fact, we make our own compressor. We stand over them all for 10 years. We only basically give a 10 year warrant on all our compressors. Now that's by our lightning strike or a car runs into one and one did recently that but here in outside Dublin. But uh, we're here based in Dublin to support the market and um, we're in City West in Dublin is where our headquarters is for, since 2007. We opened a big warehouse here as well in 2019 for uh, because of Brexit. So uh, we take everything in from Belgium. We um, avoid the UK if you like for any delays in that now and um, so we, we deliver either to site directly from Belgium or we uh, will store in our warehouse here in Dublin. We have 25 staff support. We do not install 
and uh, we support the market here with technical support and training plumbers and uh, everything like that. Um, what we're here today to talk about really is heat pumps, as I said, air to water systems mainly. And um, so it is an, an environmental energy technology. So basically what you're doing is extracting heat from somewhere, be it the air, the water, ground, and you're trying to upgrade it and get it into where it's required for space heating. Big drivers of this obviously is what we're looking at retrofits. There's a big drive on for retrofitting with the climate action plan between now and 2030. And uh, as you all know, the government are plans to kind of retrofit between five and 600,000 houses over the next 10 years. And we know at least 400,000 of those, the aim is for heat pumps. That's alongside any new build as well. So that's not including new build, 400,000 on the retrofit market alone. Basically, what is a heat pump? It's like a fridge in reverse. It's the easiest way of probably describing it. Um, if you ever put your hand at the back of a fridge, there's a coil there and you feel that and it's warm because a fridge is a sealed box. And uh, what you're trying to do is keep any heat not going in. You're trying to keep it cool, you extract any heat. But when houses nowadays, what we're doing, we're sealing them up the same way. So we're trying to seal it up, get ventilation into it, get a lot of insulation in, keep it warm, and get, it, get the heat into it as cheap as possible keep it there. So it's like a refrigerator reverse the easiest way of describing it. You can often see what is a COP and the easiest way of describing that I always put up a slide just to describe it for those who don't know. But it means for every kilowatt of energy used that you're going to get more than what you paid for. If you take the very best boilers on the market, maybe maybe about 90, 95, 97% efficient for the best um, <clears throat> it's not even 100%, but if you imagine it was 100% efficient for every kilowatt hour of energy you buy, you'll get one kilowatt back. But with a heat pump, you're getting free energy. So for every kilowatt, if it means a COP of four, every kilowatt you spend on it, you're going to get three extra kilowatts back. So three are free. Now, you've got to remember the COP is examined uh, and it's under test conditions. So when they send it for your event test, test, testing or whatever testing they do throughout Europe and all the the independent testing laboratories, it's tested at the optimum conditions. The chances of a householder ever getting the full spec of what a COP is, 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 is very minimal. It's like when they test cars, they're tested at the optimum conditions for you know, fuel efficiency, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> So what are the, the benefits? What are the different types out there? So there's really air source, water source, and ground source. Water source means you're going to be beside the river, you know, the, the harbor, wherever. And there's only about 2% of those in Ireland. Um, you know, it, it's expensive to, to pawn. You're going to need licenses, et cetera. Ground source, we manufacture as a manufacturer a lot of ground source heat pumps. We haven't sold one, believe it or not, in Ireland in the last nine years. We sell mainly into northern Russia and the, in the Scandinavian countries, where in the wintertime there might be 15 feet of snow on the ground, and the, the COP is better to get it out of the ground there. But the efficiencies of uh, air to water systems increased so much in the last number of years that that's the way it's moving. It's a quicker install and a lot less capital costs than having to either put in boreholes or dig up half an acre of garden to put in um, a ground source. What we're talking about today, you got to remember, is a low temperature system. That's what a heat pump is. So when we look at underfloor, we're talking around 35 degree flow rate. And what we're looking at radiators, we're talking about 45. And we'll discuss the different radiators later on in this program. So we're looking at low temperature. It's not like a boiler where you touch the radiator, it's hot, and it's 60 to 70 degrees. We're talking 35 to 32, roughly, to 45 degrees. With a heat pump, you're always going to have some sort of outdoor unit. It could be a single fan or a twin fan. Now, that's determined by the size of the property that you're actually trying to heat. Generally, a single fan unit will do up to maybe in a Daikin unit about 180 square meters. Now, within that, you have different compressor sizes, four, six, and eight kilowatt, as an example. And uh, you, it's important you size it right for the property that you're actually going to put the heat pump in. You will have an outdoor unit and you will have some sort of indoor unit if it's what we call a split, split type system. The two main uh, types of heat pump are monoblock and split when you're talking low temperature air to water systems. I will talk about a little bit about split systems first of all. So split, the easiest way I find to remember this, it's split in two. You have an outdoor unit and you have an indoor unit. This is called a floor standing unit or uh, integrated as it's known in the industry. It means the hot water cylinder is combined inside of this. It's like a fridge, a floor standing fridge for want of a better word. And the Daikin unit is only 600 square. So it's the same footprint as a washing machine or a dishwasher. 
some very little space. It's ideal in going into utility rooms or if it's to go upstairs into a hot press in uh, say a retrofit or even under the stairs, I've seen it in retrofitting going on. So it's a very small footprint and um, it means that your cylinder is built in, all your heat pump elements are built into it. It's ideal for um, warranties, etc., because the manufacturer as us and I can retake uh, warranty uh, on all the components that are in your three port valve, your pressure vessels, etc. If you're really restricted for room, you can have what they call a wall hung version. So it looks forever like a gas boiler, much the same footprint, except it's a little bit longer in length. And then you will have a separate cylinder with that as well. And with the separate cylinder, it gives you a little bit more scope if it was maybe B and B or somewhere that wants maybe a large hot water cylinder, four or five hundred or a thousand liters or whatever. So with the split system. The connection between outdoor and indoor is refrigerant in it. It's not water, okay? And it's a very narrow bore pipe. It's generally quarter and five eighth inch. So it's pre-insulated, it comes in a roll, and you need somebody who's F-Gas certified to do that. It's not a standard plumber who does it. The plumber will actually install the unit itself. He'll mount the outdoor unit, but he will get a fridge person to come along for a couple of hours to run the pipe and to do, to do the connections because to flare the pipe and fill it with the refrigerant. The unit comes pre-charged within the compressor for a 10 meter run. But one of the big advantages with the split is you can have the outdoor unit up to 27 meters away from the indoor. So if you have a client wants to put maybe the, the outdoor unit down the back garden or up on top of the roof, whatever they're gonna mount it, you have 27 meters to play with. Because it's a refrigerant, you won't have any freezing issues. It's guaranteed to work at minus 30 degrees and it's certified for that. A lot of county councils and a lot of uh, housing associations like refrigerant splits because of the fact that the tenant leaves the house in, the, in say the November, December area. And uh, a cold weather comes in and a couple of weeks later, if it's water in the system and there's no power and the pump isn't running, you could actually, the heat exchanger could freeze and then you're going to have to replace the whole outdoor unit, maybe even the indoor, depending on where the heat exchanger is placed. So it's important uh, and it's a good factor. It's also very, very efficient because all the units are combined and built into it. It's highly insulated cylinder. Um, it's very important, you know, it, it, in terms of what's looked under under the SEAI um, sign-off documents and eco-design data, because everything's combined in one, it meets very, very high efficiencies. So as I say, you have 27 meters apart, very small footprint, no freezing issues and high COPs. It can also go up to 65 degrees, which is ideal for maybe retrofitting. However, you don't want to run out of that flow rate, same as a boiler. You want to get it down to um, 45 degree flow rates. And that's really where all your, um, your insulation comes in, your good quality windows. And I know Andrew, a few of the others have talked about this. It's, it's really the, the fabric, fabric first approach should be taken all the time. Basically, it's an NZEP solution for residential buildings. And again, with a twin fan, for bigger houses, up to maybe 400, 500 square meters, there's a twin fan version of about 16 kilowatt as well. As I say, you have a bit more flexibility if you want a wall hung, because in a lot of uh, properties you might see that existing gas boilers behind a press in the kitchen. Well, that means it's already pre-plumbed for the cylinder upstairs. So you can take out the gas boiler, connect this up to the water connections and connect the outdoor to the indoor. If solar thermal is already on the house, well, you can connect that into maybe a twin coil cylinder. So really the cylinder as well, would, if it's retrofitting, you need to look at that because sometimes the older cylinders, there's no insulation, there's a lag indicator or something. So again, it's up to the installer or the um, surveyor to have a look at that and see what, what needs to be done. Just to give you a rough idea of a schematic. So an outdoor gets connected to the indoor and you've only five pipes off it because everything is already pre-connected and pre-done within the unit. Uh, and a lot of occasions, sometimes if the utility room, you could go back to back, which is terrific, it makes things very easy. And because it's only small bore pipe, you only core a very small hole in the wall. You don't have to do a six inch core. 70, 75 mil core will actually do it. And that will fit your pipe with the insulation. In a lot of occasions, they might run it up through a false down pipe. So it looks like a down pipe outside. They run the pipe into the soffit, run across the attic and down into the hot press if that's where the unit is. So again, that's looked at in the initial installation and where they're going to put it in the survey. And then you'll have your flow on the unit, the connection's done, flow and return out to wherever your hot water. A lot of houses now these days, they've uh, on the floor downstairs and rats upstairs. And uh, you'll have your hot water flow out going to these and your return cool water coming back. There's what's called a bypass valve. 
put in. That's very, very important. Again, installers will know this. Um, extremely important because within a heat pump, you need a minimum flow rate. If somebody shuts off all the um, all the radiators because it could throw it into a fault. So you need to have a bypass valve. And that's normally put at the furthest point in the system. Again, it's uh, again, plumbers and all will understand this. So your two connections, you say you have six connections at the top, the two which I explained already for the refrigerant to the outdoor your flow and return for your space heating. And then your cold water comes in through your big plastic tank in your attic, and the hot water out to your uh, taps and showers, etc. Some um, <clears throat> manufacturers use what they call pre plumbs tanks. Uh, again, they're very well insulated, very good quality tanks. However, you have a lot more pipe work and a lot more work has to go into it because of the fact that there's a lot of insulation has to, all those pipes have to be insulated. And sometimes you might find if somebody comes along, a plumber comes along in four or five years, they can have problems trying to locate which pipe is which, which is connected to where. So it can take up, and it actually takes up a little more in, in the labor and the original installation. As you can see, very neat pipe work there, but take up quite a bit of space. This is the other alternative that we offer as a Daikin unit. Uh, everything's combined in it. So, uh, you know, it's, it's aesthetically much more pleasing. That's one in a utility room, a couple of different utility rooms, just to give you an idea. Very, very neat install. You have a, you have a, a press above it as well. And all service works get done through the top there. So the unit never has to be pulled out again. It's installed, it's there. And this, this top slides down and all service work can be done through that. Another one, this is a site in Wicklow. And uh, again, your outdoor unit then, and I'll explain a little things about what you need for outdoor unit as, as we go along as well. So indoor, outdoor, and as you can see, normally the outdoor unit, there's a ducting here and it's a six inch dunt that, that runs underground because this is down the garden and your pipe work goes into this and your electric cable as well. Very important that when that pipe work is put in, when the foundations are poured that it's kept dry. So it should be sealed at both ends. Otherwise, if it fills with water, that's going to cause the homeowner a lot of issues because what happens is the heat pump is going to be um, giving off heat from those pipes running it, and all it's doing is heating a big tube of water. So very important, and installers know this, but you'd be amazed the amount of sites where it's not sealed properly and water gets into it. And you, you don't know a couple of months later, the homeowner starts ringing the installer to say that, look, my heating bills are going up, I have no real heat, and you have a 20 or 30 degree difference between the pipe outside and the pipe inside. Um, that's a little bit about split systems. So really it's to give you the idea of what, what it is. So it's a, it's a connection of a pipe between outdoor and insert with a refrigerant. Um, once, it's, once it's charged up when it's installed, the plumber can always service the unit after that. It's a one-off, you never have to go back to the, to the pipe work again. It's sealed, it's connected, it's filled, so it's once off. The, the plumber does everything after that. The plumber maintains the unit and goes back and does an annual maintenance on it as well. So what we're going to talk about now for a couple of slides is monoblock. And monoblocks, you'll see, they are tend to be a bit bigger because all the components that you saw inside on the indoor unit, you don't have that anymore. All the components are combined in the outdoor unit and attached to the side of it. So you don't have an indoor, all you have is a hot water cylinder indoors. That's all you would have. And um, it's a water-based connection. So it tends to be one inch copper between the outdoor and the indoor unit. And when I say that, it needs to be a one inch internal bore. You can use what they call multi-layer pipe these days, but that needs to be wider to get the one inch bore. So you're looking at 32 or 35 mil. And you are restricted really to 10 meters because you will have heat losses with the water-based connection as it leaves the outdoor unit, because that's where your pump, heat exchanger, everything else is going to the unit. So to keep those, those losses down at a minimum, the monoblock tends to be closer to the house or right beside it is the easiest description to it. So basically, and I'll show you a schematic now in a minute, you're going to have your flow and return pipe going to a three-port valve, and that will, um, that will send it off to either your space heating or your hot water. Generally, you need to check for compliance. Uh, any of our splits will meet compliance, but for monoblocks, you will have to check if they will, because uh, if it's a new build or if it's retrofitting, depending on the tank that's used, maybe there's a third party cylinder. If it's a Daikin cylinder, we can give you all the design data, but check that it's going to meet compliance. Not all monoblocks will do that. We are introducing a new one, which we uh, installed the first one, a new R32, first on the market. Um, 
to meet these kind of design um, uh, caricatures, if you like. It's only a single fan for a 9, 11, 14, and 16 kilowatt. Uh, it's gray and silver in, in design. It also means that it'll fit under windowsills in most cases as well. But we can guarantee a, um, a flow rate of when it's at minus 20, we can guarantee um, your high ambient temperatures with it. We can guarantee the heating capacity, in other words. So it can deliver up to 60 degrees, where our old monoblock used to do 55. So with this new R32 refrigerant, it's an A triple plus machine. And uh, you're looking at 60 degree leaving water temperature in it as well. So as I say, a single fan, it's a bit of a game changer in the monoblock market. And you'll see this starting to come on where the official release of them is in the last two weeks or so. So first one it was installed in Dormanstown a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's a single fan, as I say, again, a flow and return, and we have bypass, or, or sorry, anti-freeze valves are highly recommended going to these because if there's a power cut or your area that's prone to power cuts, because it's water in the system, the antifreeze valve will get the water if there's no power going to the system and it hits the freezing point. It means it will save the heat exchanger and can save you a few bobs. So it's, it's recommended on any water-based systems that you should put in antifreeze valves. You can put glycol in the system as another um, uh, option. However, I tend to find with glycol, it's harder to work in the pump, so the pump has to be set for certain settings to glycol. But sometimes if it's topped up over the uh, you know, couple of years that it's in, if it's underfloor or whatever, it tends to dilute the, the glycol that's in the system. But, but it is another option that is there to use. So as I say, a monoblock, you're going to have 10 meters is the max you can run to, uh, uh, to the between the, the tank of the heat losses. So again, you have a three-port valve. That's either going to you look at the call for heating the water in the cylinder or for heating your radiators or underfloor for space heating or for um for, for hot water so a monoblock a monoblock again the same uh we're talking low temperature systems here 45 degree for rads and uh underfloor at, at 32 so that's really the differences if you like between your monoblock and your split system i'm going to touch on something here which is a bit unique in the market which is high temperature High temperature heat people will do 70 degrees flow rate. It's designed somewhere where maybe it's a listed building or there's big old radiators, could be a big country house, uh, they're all rads, and the budget isn't there to maybe insulate the house, do up the windows, but the old oil boiler is on its way out. And the client is looking at maybe putting in uh, renewable energy. They want to put a heat pump in. It's not quite the efficiencies that you'll get out of a low temperature because of the fact it's going at 70 degrees. So your COP is around about three, roughly. Um, it's a single fan unit. It's not designed for smaller houses. It's designed for kind of your 200 meter, 200 square meter and upwards. It's because it runs in kind of uh, 14, 16 and 18 kilowatt. Uh, we flew a prototype in for the RIA show uh, for the architects there uh, in 2019 and one product of the show at that. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's a bit of a game changer in the market, or 32 refrigerant, but it's not going to be the bread and butter, as I say. It's, it's, it's unique. It's designed for houses that have big old radiators or maybe listed buildings. It's not for any of your new builds or where we're looking at uh, your standard houses for retrofitting and that. But something just to keep in mind if it was something you were uh, where maybe a particular project came up. Ground sources, as I say, we haven't sold one in Ireland in quite a long time, but we see certainly the replacement market there because we've come into our second generation here in Ireland now. Units are in 15, 20, 25 years, and so they're coming into a replacement market. You already have your boreholes there or your, your pumps running through the, the back garden or the back field, and you're only replacing the in over unit. Uh, again, we, we in Dyken are uniforming the look of all our heat pumps, so it's very neat, 600 wide, and uh, they're a very, very neat and very easy system to work. You'll see the controls in the front, a bit, a bit like a mini iPad. Everything is there, very easy to read overall. So that's a little bit on the, the ground source. I'm going to touch on air-to-air -air systems for a minute because um, it's a little bit different, but um, we're, we're, I've been involved in the last six years, a lot of uh, retrofitting, particularly where you're replacing storage heaters. So there's no wet system in the property. It's, this is not for new build, this is for retrofitting. 
and uh, to put a wet system in and maybe apartment blocks is very very expensive so if it's a maybe something built in the 50s 60s or 70s whatever and um, air to air it's called a multi-split so you have one outdoor and that's connected to several indoors and you can have different types you can have a fan coil put vector sitting on the wall or you can have um, what we call high wall units something like this 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 here and um, it needs again on retrofitting to be done in conjunction with a fabric upgrade or windows and doors as well you can't just put it into a 1960s building and start it to be and expect it to be efficient with no upgrade and install insulation so basically what you're putting in is you're putting in a um maybe a three kilowatt or three and a half kilowatt might be in the living dining room area if it's a two bedroom apartment. And then you'll have a small one kilowatt unit in each of the bedrooms. The bathrooms tend to be taken care of by a pull cord heater, but um, the these heat up rapidly. So you'll have the apartment at 21 degrees within a matter of 15 minutes. Our feedback some, from some of the housing associations and county councils that uh, where we use these, some that are in three or four years, is the cost of running these is around about eight to nine euros a week in the cold season, so your Decembers and Januaries, where they were paying 50 to 60 a week with old storage heaters that were inefficient. So the efficiency is really, really high on these, and they're simple to work as well. The fact that uh, you have a multi split, you can put up to five units off one uh, outdoor. In Ireland, it tends to maybe three, four max under our. Um, our compliance conditions. So um, most of the apartment projects I've worked on are either one or two bedrooms. So you have one outdoor connected to one or two indoors. And um, as I say, there's little sensors on them. So if somebody was sitting under one of the units there, like in the sofa there, the sensor picks up that they're there and the vent turns away and um, distributes the heat either over them or under them. There's a sensor as well. If somebody leaves the room after 15 minutes, uh, it turns in, it goes, so maybe they've gone to the shops and they haven't turned it down, it turns it into an eco mode. Very simple to make. Um, filter in it, you take it out and wash it under the tap and clip it back into it. So very simple for that. And again, the controls on it are very simple, a little like a TV remote and it switches on or off or you could work it as a thermostat, etc. as well. Getting into the heat pump design itself, you need to have at least 250 mil around unit you need a gap at 250 mil because it takes in the air there and blows it out the front uh, 250 at the sides as well but um, do you do not put it up right up against a wall because it needs that airflow or you've got to be careful as I said that in a recirculation of outdoor where door air is paramount never block the system as well with a single fan you can get down to 350 but we highly recommend at least a meter and a half in front of bins or anything in front of it because if you get blockages it restricts the airflow and it can actually start to build up ice and the efficiencies of the unit run down as well so make sure there's acceptable air discharge very very important um, noise considerations as well generally with double glazing you won't hear it i mean we have a lot of sites and i can hear with the 50 houses in a row going off in a site at 53 o'clock in the morning where maybe they're uh, coming on for a few minutes to top up water or whatever you don't hear them 45 decibels is kind of the, the level around at that. Um, you will need maybe, uh, for instance, if it's in an area where it's at the you know uh, gable end of a house, you may need to put a drip tray underneath. If it's on grass or gravel, any water that runs off or condensate, as we call it, it's just cold water that could form ice on the ground. And if there's maybe kids walking in and out bikes at the gable end of the house through a passageway, somebody bringing the bins or whatever. That could form ice, so you want a drip tray there. That's very important. And I'll show you some pictures now in a few minutes. Uh, noise levels, as I say, a quiet library. The big HT unit we showed is the quiet on the market. It only, it's only 35 decibels. Quieter. It's like whisper quiet. Our new monoblock is the same. And our standard splits are monoblock single fan are around about 45 decibels and 55 to 65 for twin fans. So the same as a normal conversation, but not loud at all. Vacuums, certain lawnmowers, that are a lot noisier. So as I was saying earlier, they should all get mounted on maybe flexi feet that raises the unit 
off the ground a little. It gives it just stops debris buildup. In Ireland, we are very lucky. In Ireland, we're, we're an ideal country for actually heat pumps because we've no uh, extremes. We don't have your minus 30 degree in winter or we don't get plus Mediterranean 30 and 40 degrees in the summer. We have a perfect climate for, for heat pumps. We're looking and we design conditions around minus five here and uh, to maybe uh, plus 28. And, uh, you know, but the heat pumps are designed to go much lower than that or higher. So you don't have any issues there. You should have a drip tray, as I said earlier, if it's on the gable end of a house or somewhere where um, it's a passageway with people coming through and that collects any water and that's drained off into a downpipe or a shore. To give you some ideas of some photographs, for instance, this is a county council in the Midlands for a house there. And as you can see, a nice gravel path where any water runs off it, <coughs> excuse me, in the cold winter, um, just drops off and runs off into the gravel path there. Very important, again, I said earlier, that the pipe it runs through is sealed up. No water, no egress gets into it because we want that dry. And that runs under a pipe underground. It comes up into the utility room in that house. In the valley of a house there, it's well out of the way, but it's very important. It's somewhere where it can be serviced. That's one of the main things. Again, you can landscape around them and do a lot with it. With a split system, the big advantage, as I said earlier, um, it can be you have 27 meters to play with. So it could be, in fact, our previous model, you could work with 30 meters. So um, it's there and, um, it, you know, so you, you can make it look as well or do whatever you want with it in terms of landscape, et cetera. The indoor unit, again, very, very neat. That's it in a utility room there. Fits in in line with the, with the countertops and very easy for, for the uh, homeowner to use, et cetera, and easy for servicing. Um, Again, if you're looking at apartment blocks, servicing is paramount. You need access to them. That's a, a, a apartment block in town there. So again, access very important for servicing and uh, initial installation. So uh, it's, it's good that it's set up. Right. If any of you are looking at listed buildings and somewhere where well, the client wants to hide it or homeowner wants to hide it, well, you can actually wrap the unit. Uh, there's a lot of van wrapping companies and I've seen quite a few done. If any of you are ever in Dublin and you go around Leeson Street Bridge, there's a red building over to the right that are coming into the city and it has its units all um, has, has a red covering on them there to make a blend into the red building earlier. So again, a lot of things you can do. All Dyken units, because we're an island, as you all well know, um, all, every Dyken heat pump is pre-seawater coat. It's, uh, it's much cheaper for us to pre-seawater coat every unit rather than pull off certain ones on the line, which is a particular order for them. Um, <clears throat> so we, 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 we can give a letter to anybody just covering that. So all the fins and everything are pre-treated before leaving the factory. If there was a heat pump, and again, you know, installers will know this, but if you're in the top of a mountain or in the middle of a harbour, for instance, and the storm winds are going to come in on the middle of winter, I would highly recommend that um, put the unit around the back of the house so that there's not deep storm winds or waves coming up on top of it all the time. So put it around to the, to the back of the house or somewhere where there's, there's, there's less winds. A lot of accessories are available. Uh, we get a quest for a lot of your drip trays, your flexi feet and cages in particular. Some people need cages around them for, for whatever you know reason, but that, that's all available as well. And then your flexi feet. The rubber feet are great. It, keep it, it keeps it kind of 100 mil off the ground minimum. And the anti vibration feet as well so it gives it you know with a pipe is connected a little bit of play never bolt them directly into the ground that's a real no-no because uh, if you get freezing weather you can freeze the coil on it now with Dyken systems it's unique unique the fact that we have a free hanging coil that uh, we have a coil that takes a little bit from the heat exchanger from the, the upper coils etc as well very very small microbore pipe and it keeps the uh, bottom of the unit dry but it's got to be kept up off the ground very very important so really gauging the suitability for heat pump, uh, which is what a lot of people want to know. So for a new build, we know it's a no brainer because houses are built to NZEP standards now. So we know there's an awful lot of uh, insulation going in. There's very small heat losses. The houses are well ventilated. They have good windows and um, David from Nordan will be here next week to talk about windows, et cetera. And, um, you know, so about ventilating the house, plenty of insulation on new builds. So we know they're going to meet an A standard anyway. It's where retrofits are done. That's where the considerations need to come in. So you've got to look at, you know, what, what's the insulation levels there? Is there a new extension going on that's going to be highly insulated, going to have underfloor? 
but the old part of the house is built in the 40s and they've old steel radiators there well you know that's a no, that's that's not an issue with Daikin's heat pump systems we uh, we can actually give you within that system you can have two control systems so you'll have underfloor downstairs at um at, at 32 or 35 degree floor rate but yet upstairs in the old rads that can be at 50 degrees if you want 55 whatever you choose so you'll have a stat upstairs for that and a stat downstairs to control it and that can be done within like in heat pumps, we can do that. So look at the insulation levels and look at what the heat emitters are. Do those heat emitters have to be changed? Because you really need to do a heat loss calculation if it's an old house to look at the uh, old radiators. Um, chances are in a lot of old buildings I've come across, a lot of the radiators were oversized in the first place, but the plumber should do a heat loss calculation because if you're putting in like for like, if you're putting in steel radiators and it was an old boiler or a gas or upgrading a boiler with a heat pump, because the flow rate is going to be 45 degrees is against 70, the heat pump will, or sorry, the radiator will need to be 20 to 30 percent bigger so the chances are you may get away with it if you're doing tons of insulation or it may have to be resized if you're going for aluminium radiators again they're going to be upgraded so you're going to you're going to have less space on the wall for aluminium radiators but really make sure a heat loss calculation is done and make sure that that's looked after as I say, radiators are the most popular form of heating in Ireland, water filled. And underfloor is becoming very popular as well now because the prices have dropped over the last number of years. Um, in terms of, uh, they were, they're very good for meeting compliance, excellent for distributing the heat as well. And the fact that you can actually run it about two degrees lower than if you're gonna have radiators on the wall. It's nice for design also because you can move furniture about also. You, you, you know, for aesthetics, you can put the, 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 the sofa up against walls wherever you want and you're going to get a, an even comfort level throughout the whole of the the floor wherever it is laid a bonus to that if you have dogs or cats or anything like that they happen to love it as well they can sprawl out anywhere they want but it also a lot of less drafts and um, because the flooring has been insulated underneath and a lot less dust as well you don't get your dust bit up under uh, at the back of the radiators or anything like that um, as I said earlier, the most common form in Ireland is your water-filled radiator, and you're looking at design flow rate. So you've got to remember that if you're doing an upgrade, that when you look at the rads, you've got to make sure it's sized for heat pump. Uh, all merchants are geared up to do sizings and all for this from the radiator supplier that they do. We, we're a manufacturer of heat pumps. We don't supply or design or install radiators or anything like that. Uh, we have a program that can help you do that, and I'll talk about that now in a minute. But... Um, it's important that it's designed for a flow rate of 45 degrees. Um, you know, 35 if it's going to be underfloor, and a lot of houses projects it's underfloor downstairs or rads upstairs. But you know, for retrofitting, you tend to find it's rads all over. So if you're going for uh, aluminium, it takes up less room. But just all I can do is really, really encourage you to make sure that a heat load calculation is done before you go installing them. Otherwise, they may not meet compliance. Other thing too, radiator covers, um, there was a big fad for them uh, a couple of years back. <clears throat> I would not encourage them because it's amazing when you're looking at low temperature source, 45 degrees, the amount of heat a rad cover box off. So make it a no-no if it's, if it's in a house. Heat pump convectors are becoming a little bit more popular now as well. They tend to be a bit more uh, expensive than radiators, but we're getting a lot of requests in the last two years in particular because extensions going on tend to be um, a lot of glass in them. And in the, in the summertime, that area can be very, very hot. With our heat pumps, you can have a reversible model. And it means you can have air conditioning if in that area in the in the summertime. So it's a heat pump convector. It will go on the wall. We do a high wall version as well that look like the wall to wall or the air to air systems I showed you earlier. And this actually sits on your wall and will give you air conditioning in the summer to cool down the room. Uh, as a bonus, in fact, as well, it can actually do heating if you need a quick to heat in the uh, in the winter time as well. But mainly there, you're going to be using your heat pump. But if you had an area that needs cooling just keep it in mind any of our uh, heat pumps can do that and uh, heat, pump, heat pump convector is ideal and we, we we can have details you can send us an email we'll give you details on that the biggest problem we find about heat pumps uh, going on and um really is the actual fitting of them you the first uh, call a um sometimes an installer so a lot of times an architect or if it's a county council or housing association their maintenance chaps get the heat pump isn't working 
99% of the time we find the heat pump is working. It's not the fault of it. it tends to come down to the initial installation. Uh, something isn't done right, pipes are wrong, it wasn't piped right, there's wrong flow rates, there's a lot of issues and we're going there all the time so we're really working hard. We have a great reputation in the market like it but we want to make sure all our installers are up to a certain standard. We have a very big bank of installers throughout Ireland that we've trained but we're ongoing trying to get new plumbers all the time and this is now at this stage there's a big switch over from gas and oil over to uh, renewables from fossil fuels and we want to get it more and more so if you have any plumbers or if you know any plumbers need training they can send an email to us training.ie i'll put the email up later on we will train them for free and because we want them to do training we want to put heat pumps in at a good standard we want a proper high standard for them to where there's no callbacks where everything is done it's commissioned right set up right and the homeowner is very happy they need to have a bit of basis on, you know, not only do they need their plumbing qualifications, they may not need F gas because they'll get a lad in to do that. That's a refrigerant engineer. In fact, they wouldn't have the equipment for that to, to for a fridge engineer. It's a different training and uh, the gauges and the equipment you need is about three and a half thousand euros worth. So um, a lot of plumbers will do the F gas or sorry, will do their own plumbing works. They'll install the unit and then they have the F gas chap do the connections, maybe get to commission the unit at the end. In fact, it frees them up to do their own plumbing work. So the actual install can be lower than if you may be a monoblock and having to get the pipe benders out and put in all your extra pipe works and one inch copper or whatever. So a split can be, um, it can work out cheaper in the end to do. And again, you get the extra benefit of um, a, a high efficiency system then as well. They need to know a little bit about wiring regulations. No plumber wants to be an electrician, but uh, they're going to be able to tell the sparks what size cables to put in. They say, look, I need you to run a six square cable from the the, um, the electrical box up to the um, hot press or whatever. So you need to put in these breaker sizes. So they need to know that. However, we give them all schematic books for everything that they're going to do. And we help them, we, we, we train them. And again, with them, um, talk to you about going on the, the, the requirements that are needed because I tend to find when grants come in there's the have a go merchants and the last thing you need is a homeowner or an install not an installer but as a well as an installer you do because these guys give you a bad reputation so somebody you have a go merchant you really need the proper qualifications get the references and we will give you ongoing training at the moment we're doing a lot of it through webinars but as soon as we um COVID situation um you know Please God, the sooner the better. We can actually then get on the tools training as well. We'll have our setup in our City West offices here and then in Tech and a few other setups that we've set up around the country as well, training centers. And um, so anybody interested in doing training for installing heat pumps, please, please come back to us. This is the kind of thing we want to eliminate. Somebody sends an apprentice out and they turn the, have the unit going backwards. I mean, this is the most basic thing nobody could, could stuff that shouldn't be done. You shouldn't be putting, a, attaching a, um, your isolator switch to the unit as well. I mean, there'd be slots made for this if this is what I can want you to do and other heat pump companies as well. You may, may, many times I see this, there's no need for that. It should be going on the wall. This unit should be around the other way and this is not even sealed. That's gonna fill up with water and you're gonna have a very irate homeowner in a couple of months time. So just pointing out a few small things that shouldn't be done. Again, this unit was installed perfect, but the homeowner decided to want the fence in front of it call the installer about six months later because his bills are going through the roof then the installer came to find this so things like this as i said earlier you need a meter and a half clearance at the at the front of the unit um that's just giving you some little basics on on and heat pumps there i know we're a little bit restricted to time these days and so i'm uh, just getting down to the last few slides here there is a lot of grants out there at the moment and uh <coughs> excuse me there uh, three and a half thousand is quite a significant grant for a heat pump. Generally, installations of heat pumps I'm hearing are anywhere from about eight and a half thousand plus VAT to about ten and a half to twelve and a half thousand, dependent on the size and the works that need to be scoped out. So, um, you know, if there's multiple units been done together, you probably get better price than that. But that's to give you a kind of a ballpark. Servicing um, tends to tends to be around about one fifty. You might get cheaper than that. That tends to be a service cost. Um, you know, it's not a lot more than a, a gas boiler, an oil boiler is these days. But with a, and I think it's not only ourselves, but any manufacturer of heat always requires an annual maintenance. And um, 
it's very important that this is done. You've got to remember for a lot of people, this is the most expensive piece of kit you're going to have in your house. A heat pump is 10 to 15,000 that's sitting in a house there. And um, even though there's not a lot of moving parts, but there is there is some of your pumps, your three port valves, your flow sensors and that sort of thing. So it's very important that maintenance is carried out because it will eliminate uh, issues down the road, but it'll also make sure the, efficient, the, the system is running efficiently as well. Um, we've set up a couple of programs to actually help people as well. Um, we've called, we have a, a program called uh, Die Can Stand By Me. A lot of you might remember from the old uh, movie or from the Benny King famous song, Stand By Me. It's an easy way to remember it. If you go onto Google and type in Stand By Me, we have what we call three branches of a heating solutions navigator, uh, Stand By Me itself, and a need care app. And Heating Solutions Navigator is a free software program. So you go on first to Stand By Me and you register. And um, this software program, it's a kind of a tool to configure your installation. So you can create custom made piping diagrams. So for your underfloor systems, it will size all your rads for you, for your underfloor, do a diagram, give you all your outputs, and then you can give it over to the installer. And not a lot of your lads, architects and installers are using this. So it's called Daikin um, Stand By Me, and it's called the Heating Solutions Navigator within that program. It'll pick the heat pump and all for you. It's a very simple program to work. Um, even uh, an old timer like me, uh, I find it simple enough. It took me, I have to say, my first uh, use of it about 40, 45 minutes. But uh, any of the good young guys here, good in computers, they do this in 10 minutes. They size a house in under 10 minutes. Any size house from your small cottage, to your apartment, to uh, three, four, five, six bedroom houses, whatever you want to do. So uh, it's all there, uh, single story, end of terrace, um, terraced houses, whatever you want, you can do it within this. Then we have the Stand By Me program itself, which um, as I said earlier, with warranties and all that, it's something we're trying to make a lot easier for our installers, for our homeowners, for everybody. As I said earlier, you tend to get, well, the, home, the heat pump isn't working well, when you find out it is, maybe it wasn't installed right. So we're trying to get make sure that installers are up to a certain standard. And when we do training with an installer, if they get this, uh, they, it means they can download a program called Stand By Me and an eCare app on their phone. So when they install a heat pump, there's a built-in scanner into this. They scan the outdoor and the indoor, if it's mono, but they'll scan the uh, outdoor only. And that automatically, with that barcode, automatically uploads to the Daikin website, to the Daikin portal, I should say, but also to the um, to the installer's portal, the details of that heat pump. It gives us make, model, serial number, where it was installed, when it was installed. There's a Google Maps reference to it as well. And then he's also uploading with that alone, there's a, a, a part we can add on the actual commissioning form or any photographs that need to be uploaded as well. As soon as the uh, installer does that, he gets back a little five digit code, which he gives over to the homeowner and says to them, you need to register that for warranty. So the homeowner goes on to the Like and Stand By Me program, registers with this little code, and it opens up then on what they'll see on the screen is their unit, the make model serial number, their name address, the make model, when it was installed, and when their warranty runs out as well. Any servicing that's done as well in between, what happens is with this program, because they're already registered, the homeowner and the installer gets three email reminders per year, three months, three weeks, three days before services is due. So it's reminding the homeowner that they need service. It's also reminding the installer that it's a quiet time, make arrangements with the uh, homeowner to do the annual service. And it keeps the system in tip top condition. The other thing it does as well, particularly with new houses, if people aren't going to be staying in those houses for all of their life, it means there's a kind of like a logbook and a card, there's a service registration built up so if they ever sell the house in 10 or 15 years, well, the whole service program is there for the new owner. They can see what was done. And um, it also helps it helps the owner in the fact that um, they can see the service record that was done and they can pass that on then to the to the new owner of the house. The eCare app then, uh, where the home or where the installer has, the, uh, has access to this, then that helps them with commissioning, setting it up, setting up the programs, and then doing component check if they wanted to check over everything, and also to actually do if they're doing any repairs or maybe down the line servicing, they can actually uh, blow up the inside of the pump with a, with a is, you can see the parts list and everything where it's fitted, what part numbers are, and they can even order spare parts off it. So we've made things very very easy for for the installers and for the homeowner and for from everybody going down the line because we have a very um I can have a very good reputation in the market we want to try and keep it that way we're trying to make things accessible for everybody to try and keep it that way
really um, <clears throat> coming down to kind of my last slide or so, if you like now. So really, um, what does it do? Uh, so we can guarantee, as I say, down to minus 28 degrees. That's all we're allowed to certify that under Eurovent certification. But we know we've units working at minus 30 and 40 degrees in northern Russia and Scandinavia. So uh, in terms of cold weather, it's not an issue here. It's an easy installation. Generally, it's a two-day install overall. So it's a lot quicker than, say, ground source or anything like that. It's an ideal solution for a new home because um, it's, it's NZEB compliant. If you put it into a new home, you don't need any other renewables to go in as well with it. It's going to meet compliance each time. Retrofits, you have to look at these and then, as I say, uh, heat load calculations are done room by room as well. Low maintenance, once a year for your maintenance as well. Easy use for the homeowner because all you have is a stat on the wall. And it's the temperature, it's called... Um, heating controls and the stat is on the wall. The homeowner never has to go near the heat pump. They just go to the stat in the wall, turn it up or down if it's too warm or too cold. One utility bill is a big thing as well because there's a lot of star standing charges, as you well know, on utility bills. And if you can eliminate the VAT and the green standing charges that you have on maybe a gas bill uh, and your oil bill, you certainly don't have that anymore. Much cleaner as well. There's nobody, uh, you're not getting oil spillages or anything like that, trying to arrange for the oil truck to come at a certain time and run the pipes, certainly true in saying the city, run it through the house out to the backyard and into the tank. You can get rid of the tank after that, no sludge or anything like that. And uh, no carbon monoxide detector either. You don't need that unless you have a wood burning stove or something in the house, but if you're just a heat pump, you don't need that. So I just want to say thank you very much for taking the time to join us today. Um, I'm just going to wrap up here now. And, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of questions. Um, you know, there's going to be too much probably for us to take at the time, but certainly I'm here for another while to half an hour or so to answer questions you might have. And uh, But if you have any questions, you know, send them into heating at dykin.ie. If you need any support, maybe you've set up plans you need uh, help with or anything, send them in. We've, we've a team here. We can help you out with that side. So rads it might be or whatever it is and uh, but if you have an, if you are an installer you are a registered plumber and you want any training done uh, we have an email there training at dyke.ie send an email into there and we'll respond to you and uh, let you know when the next training session is going to to take place so um i was probably a bit went through a bit of that a bit quickly but i know we're restricted to time of one hour and um, I know you probably want to catch your lunch or your gobbling your sandwich down or whatever. But I just want to say thank you on behalf of myself, Ian Killock and Viking for taking the time here. And uh, I'm just going to hand you over to Andrew now and uh, to say thank you to uh, our friends in, in, in CORE and in all our colleagues in the other companies as well for um, organizing this. So um, thank you for your attendance today. And I'll hand over to Andrew now and... Um, let it go back to him and he can take over there. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Ian. Uh, that, that, that was really good. Thanks thanks for that. That's, I think we, we covered a lot as, as usual. I got yeah. to a couple of Ian's talks now and every time I always pick up something new. So, so that, that's always great to hear. Um, just a couple of the, the slides I had to start. I know there was an issue with the, I don't know whether it was headphones or what the story was. It was just people maybe missed out on a few bits and pieces. Uh, so just basically about the theme of, of our energy efficiency building seminars and what we're trying to get, get across to people and help people out with the industry. Um, our, our media partner, Passive House Plus magazine, are working very, very hard in the industry. It's a really good publication. They do a lot of good work. So they've been, they've been really good help to ourselves. And we always, we always look forward to the, the, obviously the new issues of their, their magazines. Um, there's always some really good stuff in that as well. So... I suppose moving on to, to the, the Q&A, and there's, there's a lot of uh, questions in here, Ian, so I'll maybe start going through them with you, um, if that's all right with you. you do my best, yeah. <laughs> you're still all right. You still have a little bit of brain left. <laughs> there's a little bit left there, Andrew. I'll hand it all over, whatever I have to you. <laughs> Very good. Okay, cool. Uh, do Daikin have a CO2 heat pump uh, as it has lower global warming potential, possibly? Um, uh, no, it's just something we're looking at. We have it introduced in some of our air conditioning systems we brought over a company in the UK there last year, but not in our residential um, heat pumps. No, no, oh. um, not. Or 32 is the move, and I think you'll see a lot of other industry that will become the industry standard because it's very, very clean. It's cheap as well to actually produce, and uh, that's the standard at the moment, anyway. Yeah, it makes a lot makes a lot of sense, Ian. And I suppose yeah. you already touched on it, but just you know the, the, the 
how how really is the, the important of the fabric when it comes to to selecting your heat pumps and using Oh, it's a no-brainer. I mean, just as an example, like I mean, 10 years ago in your standard build now, say 120 meter square meter new built house, we'd have put an eight or nine kilowatt in. That house now, because of the installation standards, you're down to four kilowatts. So uh, it's it's really important and it's a really warm, comfortable house. So you, you know yourself, Andrew, people, their, their house is only 10, 12 years, but as soon as they turn the boiler off at night within half an hour it's chilly you know because yes. a lot of you know there's, there's air getting into the house and that so we know now that when they're built it's and it is fabric first really and that's that's the fairness why SEA are trying to get all these older houses up to a certain standard it's about comfortable living and you know fabric I'm always like a fabric first that's your yes. that's your number one go-to okay thanks Dave. Um, another question here just about distance from the uh, the heat pump module to the to the actual property itself, like uh, somebody was asking here, that the, the outdoor unit twenty seven meters away, how will that yeah. affect efficiency? Yes, no, it won't affect efficiency at all. There, and uh, the nearer you can have, the better. The reason is that uh, you have different uh, things. Is with a compressor, it comes pre charged for ten meter run. Now, that's nothing to do with the manufacturer. That's under European transport legis legislation. You're not allowed to transport a compressor with more than enough it's i think it's 1.2 kgs uh, or g's of gas but it's uh, it's it's under uh, legislation for that so when it comes it's pre-charged for 10 meters as in a split if you want to move it down the garden maybe behind a bush or something like that the uh, installer obviously has to add more pipe and then put more refrigerant into the pipe into the pipe work so he has to charge it all up that takes extra time extra cost um 27 meters is the max run you can actually physically do it longer if you wanted to but mm. it means the indoor unit i'm not going to get to it as very technical but you have to have much more ventilation space indoors for okay. the unit if you have it just at, um, up to up to 27 meters not over that you can fit in your hot press fit into a little utility room close the doors you don't have to allow for anything like that uh, the monoblock, as I said, 10 meters because, because that's water-based, you start to get a lot more um, drop-off in the heat losses if you start to run it. You can technically run it further away from the building. The pump will do it. You can double up on your insulation if you want. I just recommend it the nearer with a monoblock you get, the better, because particularly if there was a power cut or a power outage, mm -hmm. freezing cold weather, it's just not good for it. You know? Sure, sure. Thanks, Ian. Um, well, just just one thing, and then and can can ground source be used uh, as part of the Daikin systems? And if, if so, are there any considerations around? I suppose the the trees and the usual stuff that you have in gardens. <laughs> yeah. No. Again, like uh, ground source is is terrific, very efficient in that. But again, with if with, with sites, you can't get trucks in because you've fifty houses in a row. You know. Uh, no front gardens putting boreholes in it's just it's 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 too cost expensive and the same yeah. with, with one-off houses you know unless you have the brother-in-law happens to have a free digger or something on by <laughs> maybe that'll pay for it but there's a lot of labor in laying out those pipes whereas is, the efficiencies yeah. have become like years ago there was could be you, know, you could have five or six percent efficiency difference you don't have that these days you know you might be two or three percent so the capital cost of putting in in a ground source is just so much more expensive Payback time, if you look at it, just I, I, I can't work out the figures. An air source definitely beats it every time in terms of efficiency, the cost factors as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, from what even from what I've seen, it seems that seems yeah. to agree with what you're saying, Ian. Yeah. yeah. Um, just to, is, is there uh, an off, uh, what is the optimum temperature differential between outside air uh, and the refrigerant returning? If the outside temperature is too warm, is there an impact on the COP? Um, not really, there's, there's yes and no's to that. Um, all our units have weather compensation, so there's a little um, probe, if you like, in the outdoor unit. So if we take summertime as an example, when your house is calling for 21 degrees, naturally, you know, new house going to be well insulated. It's going to reach 21 degrees, no problem. In fact, the house might be 22 or 23. So yeah. the heat pump isn't going to come on because there's no call for heat. So mm -hmm. it's cool. Uh, in the winter time, then obviously it's looking at the outside temperature and uh, that that probe that's on the unit. And when your weather compensation fitted like that, you uh, it's looking at the temperature that you want inside. So for instance, we will say you have a radiator system and it's 45 degree flow rate. Now, when it comes on, if it's a call for heat in the morning, say seven o'clock in the morning, it'll come on, it'll ramp up to 45 degrees. But as the sun starts in the morning around nine or half, 10 or nine, whatever time, yeah. the, the weather compensation is, well, I want 
21 degrees inside. Um, the sun has come up, it's getting warmer outside. So instead of doing 45, the temperature, the flow rate will start to drop. So it'll go 43, 42, might get down to 35 degree flow rate. It's still giving you your 21 comfortable heat in the house, but it's mm-hmm. becoming more efficient by, by running at that. So well, weather compensation, I think, is very important. However, you have the option of what they call just leaving water temperature. That means just keeping on a constant flow rate. You have that option. You can switch. It's just a button you can switch. Weather compensation means that it's just giving it that that bit to work on and mm. uh, it just makes the system more efficient just okay. i hope i'm answering it there but it yeah. does improves the cops if you can get it really cops as i said earlier it's a, that's the test data done as optimum efficiency don't go by that when you say well one is like 4.8 this one's 4.7 that's a better heat pump it's not necessarily a factor at all it, it's seasonal efficiency is what we look at but it's getting down to the actual installation the size of rads and you can have five houses in a row with the same heat pump but each one is going to give you different energy because somebody wants 23 degrees somebody has five baths a night instead of one it's it's every house a little bit different you know? yeah yeah no, that, that that's really good information yeah. uh, thanks Ian. I, the yeah. question here just i suppose coastal locations and, and selecting um the right equipment uh, uh against i suppose uh, acting against corrosion or, or the potential mm. of what would your advice be there yeah, it's very important. Like it is, you know, even if your house is a mile inland, you get blow in and that sort of thing. So uh, we're all, all our units are pre seawater coated. Uh, where you tend to see units getting rusted up or something like that is they've scratched the paint or somebody has yeah. uh, put the bolts in and t- tied it into concrete or something like that and they've torn the paint to the bottom and it goes from the foot straight up. So make sure rubber grommets are used. Uh, if it's, uh, and good installers will know, look, if there's a house right on the coast and the, you know, the, the beach is 20 feet away, move it to the side of the house or down where it's not getting these massive winds coming in and sandstorms and that, you know, because there's, there is seawater in the atmosphere and that sort of thing so you know th- that's it do the best protection you can for it but ours already has a seawater coating on it it doesn't need extra now if it was a lighthouse or something like that where you're going to get waves or fishing trawler which i've seen with <laughs> our units to use for refrigeration as well you will need extra gly- uh, gold coatings or something on. but for standard houses okay. look we're not alone in our island they're all around the mediterranean everywhere so it isn't an issue excellent excellent that's great um a block system can it be used for underfloor heating only. Yeah, so if you've no hot water requirement, if you just want space heating, absolutely, and it's it's ideal. So a monoblock will take up a little bit less space. Now that's a that's a, a caveat to that because uh, mm-hmm. you don't have a big heat pump inside, but you do have a cylinder inside. And any hot water cylinder, if it's more than maybe 150 liters, you tend to have insulation, 50 mil. You'll generally find that when they, they pumps valves and everything wafer, it takes up a lot more than 600 square or, or, or diameter, I should say. So look at the pipe work requirements. Monoblocks can save. We manufacture and we sell an awful lot of monoblocks. Um, but yes, it, it, it's, it's going to do the same. The efficiencies may not be quite as high in the eco design data. It's something we have found over the time in, in not only our all monoblocks. So have a look at that and compare it to a split. Splits will always, because everything is combined at one unit, tend to be that more efficient. Okay, um, next one, it's, it's kind of a hard one to answer, but I think probably the, the last part of it is probably maybe you, you could answer it just about running costs, electric for three to bed, three to four beds house. But I mean, there's, there's a lot of different factors in that as well. Yeah, there's a million and one factors. Um, yeah. If you, if you, the, the HSN ca- calculation I did at the end and showed some people there to you, that'll actually give you running costs. But again, every house is going to be different. I mean, a three, four bedroom house, I, I would imagine with uh, six to 700 a year for your space, you know, that's, you know, yeah. you may get lower depending on how well you're going, going to run it. But I, I get this question I get asked a lot. And then yeah, yeah. I find you somebody to go to a house where they, and the chap in, 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 you know, when it's minus eight outside still likes to walk around in a t-shirt and shorts in the house. <laughs> so each house is different. My own yeah. mother likes her thermostat, at, even though she's a heat pump in it, likes uh, 23 degrees. And there's a lot of insulation, which you guys did on. Uh, <laughs> you know, so it depends. Each one is different because it's not, a, in, in Eldridge, there's not a, not, not a lot of movement in the house. Yeah, sure. Um, so and, and, you're and, a little colder. And just do, if you have PV panels, can that offset some of the, I suppose, the, the electrical uh, requirement? 
Yes, uh, PV is, is a great, and I would highly recommend solar, but I wouldn't put it in specifically to for a heat pump to offset sure. it, because as we all know, you don't when you need heating, you don't get any, any solar panels because it's the middle of winter. Uh, whereas in the summer when you don't need heat, they're very, very efficient. Uh, but to, co- to heat water alone with uh, solar panels, uh, you know, to heat with a heat pump, I should say, is pence a week. It's very cheap. But, it, you know, heat with panels um, they when they're put into maybe the inverter and go into the house, there's always something in the house they're using you know there's a fridge running there's TVs there's chargers and you know with electrical yeah. chargers coming in for for cars everything there's something there so I, I'm a great I, I spent 10 years in the solar industry I'm a great, great advocate of it um, but but look at the design especially for retrofits it's going to give you bring your house up to another level when you put PV on and the prices have dropped tremendously in them um, so well worth looking at as well you know yeah, sure. Um, just can, can any of the units provide a, a cooling function? Yes, all our units, uh, as I said, with that heat pump convector I showed earlier, because we're getting a lot of requests now because a lot of glass extensions and buildings going on to the houses. You know, a lot of people sometimes will look for the three or four weeks to where we really need cooling. That's a decision you have to make. Um, can you open the windows or whatever and do it? Fair enough. But if you want cooling, that's the option. We All our units are reversible, um, but you, you need to kind of know that the start to set it up. And you could even, if you weren't too sure you're going to use it, you just pipe for half half inch uh, copper pipe to wherever you think and, and leave it behind the wall if, if for wherever you think you're going to maybe put one of those units convectors at some stage. And if you decide in like three years after you've moved in, look, it is it is too hot in this room. We put it, the pipe work is already there and the unit can do it. Um, but yes, we are finding um, certainly a lot of requests in the last six months in particular for uh, for uh, cooling in, in, okay. in, in one area of the house, not the whole house. Okay, okay, thanks. I'll kind of group the next two together. Uh, yep. Option for domestic hot water with the multi-split on, on renovations and uh, I suppose steel versus aluminium radiators because that would be a popular question on a renovation. Yep, I deal with the first one first. Hot water, when you're coming down, uh, multi-splits don't do hot water. They only do air air conditioning. But under uh, a lot of the projects I've worked on would be what they call BEC schemes, better energy communities, they're grant schemes. And SEIA allow those all right. And so you put in your multi-split system for all your heating. But you must disable the cooling. You're not allowed to have cooling in it, so you disable that. And then for hot water, that's taken care of with a well-insulated cylinder, and there's an immersion put into that on a timer for one hour a day. And uh, generally, a lot of these apartments, when they're retrofitted, there are only one or two people living in them. It's not like eight-bedroom apartments where you need 400 liter tanks. They're generally small, you know, one to 150, maybe 200 max cylinders. And, um, but your hot water is taken care of that. Air to air systems in Ireland are not compliant for new build because under the regs, you have to, your heat pump has to do uh, 80% of the hot water load. And, uh, you know, so we are working, believe it or not, as Dyke, and we are working on multi-split that will do hot water. Um, hopefully, at the end of next year, we have something like that. But for uh, certainly retrofits, it's ideal. Um, and, and that's how you take care of the water. Your other question, Andrew, on um, steel or um, aluminium. Um, yes. It's a matter for its costs and benefits and everything. You will go about 20% bigger on, on uh, 20 to 30% bigger on a steel rad uh, than if you're going to put in a boiler. Um, my experience of aluminium is they've come down a bit in price, but they still are maybe 20, 25% dearer. So, okay. you know, for a developer, if he's doing 150 houses, that can add up <laughs> a bit. However, it takes up a lot less space on the wall for aluminium. They are designed for low flow. They are terrific. I love aluminium radiators. If yeah. I was redoing my own house and it wasn't 1930s, and uh, <laughs> I would put in, yeah, definitely no flow rads if I can, you know. Oh, okay, okay. And and uh, outside of space saving uh, considerations, is there a performance uh, difference between the the splits and the monoblocks? Yes, if you look at the uh, the, the tool that uh, SEAI is the, the, the tool that they use, the efficiencies will always be higher on a split. Um, it's considered because particularly the integrated split, because this hot water cylinder is built in, all your connections, your pipes, valves, everything is done. It's all um, manufactured together to get the most efficiency out of that system. And um, under the calculation tools, that's the designer sign off and everything like that. It's all there. That data is there. It's put into the deep four now calculations and mm-hmm. it will always come out even you know any of our monoblock splits the, the, the split will always come out more efficient on it the wall hung will still be very efficient however because you've um pipe work between the wall hung and the cylinder 
is to consider heat losses there. Again, the efficiency is a little bit less than that. In fairness, when we talk about efficiencies, homeowners will never know this difference if there's five or 10%. It's if they get down to the nitty gritty and start doing calculations and spreadsheets, where comfort <laughs> level will not make a difference. It's, yeah. it's there, you know? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Um, just a very quick one. Um, the, the, the cost could be maybe eight to 10, 10K for, for a heat pump install. Uh, Roughly for a single uh, fan, yeah. Yeah, I assume the, that, that is excluding any grants and other... Excluding grants, yeah. So, I mean, I've I heard some bizarre sort of 14, you know, and then they take a grant. It shouldn't be that. That's mad. Somebody's no. having a go. Uh, but look, it's the world we live in. Um, no, I mean, a, a single fan unit, eight and a half to 10, depending on the pipe work and everything they have to do, plus VAT. And yeah. now that doesn't include radiators and, you know, all Absolutely, your yeah. valves and controls. And be actually, a twin fan will add probably another... Depending on the size, two, two and a half thousand to that as well. You know? Yeah, um, ju- just I suppose to 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 go talk about that a little bit more. Uh, I I ended up with a, a Daikin twin fan unit as, on a retrofit in my own house. Right, <laughs> and it works really really well, and uh, I, I'd, I'd highly recommend it even even in an older property that they're, they're working very well. Um, stuff, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those, it's just about sizing, and that's the important thing. That it. heat yeah. pump is sized right. It's got to be sized so that no backup heater is called in. It has a backup heater built in. If it gets to maybe you set it to maybe minus five, so if it gets after minus five, minus six, or seven, it comes in to kind of support the heater because it, it will improve the COPs. Uh, it's going to be used if you're putting the heat pump in. You don't have the outdoor unit at the start, maybe to dry the screed. You can work the backup here just to dry the screed before the outdoor unit goes in. Because sometimes this is a building site and you just get, there are people tend to take these things, you know. Um, so it can be used for that, but it's there to support the system. But the design should be that the, the it's not based on a backup heater. It's, it's done without it. And uh, it's important that the design is right. It's not oversized or undersized. And so the BER is very helpful when we get these, you know, it, it helps us a lot because some lad to ring up and say, look, I need a heat pump. It's a four story house out there in Mount Marion or somewhere. That just doesn't do it, you know. You're yes, having a go, yes. and we don't want to have a go, merchant. We want to do it, get it right because it's the homeowner who's not happy at the end. Yeah, I, I, just a quick one as well. If 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 the unit is south facing, north facing, does this have any impact on its on its efficiencies or sizing? No, no, um, no. Uh, north side, uh, north side faces is out. It's it's kind of a way, and it, it, it it's, it's probably the best because. Um, and I've only once ever found it was because it was a. Um, and it's a good question because it was south facing, and it was up against a wall, and it was a white uh, wall. And there's a little, as I said, a com- what it comes in probe at the back. But we found around midday because it was a little anomaly for about an hour in the heat. And because the reflection, <coughs> excuse me, it was the summertime and maybe it was 23, 24 degrees. It was really the heat pump, the sun beaming on it and reflecting off the wall was making the probe read about 25 or 26. So, um, but it's, it's, you know, that's that's one in about four years I've heard of that. But no, generally not north, south, foot, whatever. It comes down to where best location in terms of the pipe run to get into the house for accessibility. Um, I, I, I would look, if it was an architect, I would look at where, if it's a nice deck outside, because you've got to remember that a heat pump, you know, well, Andrew, it blows cold air. And yes, if you're sitting yeah. out having your gin and tonic in the uh, summertime <laughs> and this comes on, you know, it's going to be, it might give you air conditioning, it might cool you down a bit. But in the summer, it's not really come, come on. It might come on for a couple of minutes because it's doing the hot water or whatever. But yeah. uh, it would be a consideration, you know, so that's it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and just about, um, I suppose, accessing uh, parts lists and stuff like that for for for, for uh, the heat pumps. I mean, uh, yeah. just can be your assessor access these but i mean probably best left to the people who are who are uh trained and, and know what they're looking at possibly for that one oh yeah well that's why we're here as the manufacturer and we're only one of two we're, we're not here we're not a wholesaler or a distributor or anything we're i can so we are here yeah. from it's a japanese company but our headquarters now so it's just like they've lifted an office out of belgium dropped it here in Dublin. and we're here to support the market so for spares and technical support training so everything like that so anyway heat pump don't have a go at it yourself you know it's your installer and there's we've if you go on our website we have four service partners listed there we have uh, probably about another hundred more around the country they're the guys though you should go to first if you don't have your your installer really should be the guy you go to first because he yes. knows your heat pump system he knows the layout who what way the valves and pipes and everything are running and he would be your first port of call but but it's a good question you know it's really important as i said earlier andrew it's it's a very expensive piece of kit in your house it's 
more than probably some secondhand cars these days. Yes, so yeah. uh, it's important that it's it's well looked after, and then you get the best efficiency from it. And again, you know, but you know, any, everything is there, and uh, we we give support. But if somebody was a, maybe a, an architect or something they want help with eco design data, we supply all of that. Anything they want, be it yours, anything we're there to support them and help. Them. Okay, okay, and um, it's uh, I suppose. <laughs> Possibly a hard one to answer, but is there kind of a minimum BR rating you think you should be achieving in a house to recommend the use of, of, of uh, an air to water pump on a retrofit type scenario? Um, well, again, that comes down to the fabric. Um, we all know your good colleague John there, what he did with his house. I mean, uh, an old house that was derelict houses we see sometimes on the side of the road. And I remember the chaps from SEI looking at it saying, You're having a laugh. <laughs> and what he did, he brought it up to what was an A2 or whatever yes, it was, yeah. you know. And so you can do anything if you the budget there, it, insulation works. I, I wouldn't recommend putting a heat pump in if the house is built in the 50s and you have no insulation and the winds yeah. are single blaze. You're just wasting your money, to be honest with you. Um, upgrade your, a boiler and leave it because you've obviously, if you're doing that, you've no interest in doing anything else. So I would always look if it's an old house, if you have any budget, any money, fabric first, get your, your attic in, so get some insulation in, and then look at if you have the budget. For the heating system then after that so it's a fabric first approach you know it's, it's i think it's common sense really at the end you know yeah absolutely no no you yeah. have to you have to balance you have to balance everything up absolutely yeah um i know you i mentioned in the presentation about you know you, you showed the slide with somebody putting a nearly a fence straight up directly against the unit which and then wondering why their efficiencies went a bit crazy um, yeah 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 is is there is there any type of protection that can be used for the unit? Just say you had kids playing football and stuff like that in the back garden, and you had a unit there. Is there anything that that you would suggest? There? Yeah, there is the cages. The cages are very good. Uh, they're brilliant. And they be, then the real reason you use those is the fact that there's, well, they're obviously going to crack for football and slitters and golf or whatever. But <laughs> it's ventilation. You really need that clearance at the front. Um, I've, I've, I have can develop a particular system, which is a Louvert system. Um, it was developed for the Swiss uh, urban market where they needed to reduce it by two decibels. It was, it was around 1800. We've never sold them in Ireland. They're very expensive. Um, my answer is immediately don't. I've seen some people using louvered systems, but I know that they will be back and their heat pumps, their bills are going to increase. Um, yeah. We don't endorse anything like that. Um, but, you know, it's again, I, I would look at maybe design something that has some sort of louver where it's a wide louver, it can get the air out because it has to take it in the back, get it out the front and you don't want restrictions. Um, so if you're worried about maybe, you know, kids maybe kicking balls, maybe mount them up off the ground about 10 feet on cantilever brackets and, um, you know, a drip tray underneath it and that, that will solve the ball issue and maybe anyone running into it or that sort of thing. But, um, you know, I, 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 the cage is probably the best or maybe even build a hedge around and keep a meter and a half around from, from the unit and the hedge will will cover it as well <clears throat> okay the, the, there are there are a few more questions there which are very kind of specific so maybe yeah. i guess maybe if they if they email them directly to yourself ian you could do your best absolutely uh, yes uh, my uh, my addresses are there was it was the the, the he, heating at dyke and dot e is a great it's an easy one to remember because my name's yes. a bit weird to spell uh, <laughs> send it to me absolutely no problem or heating because that goes then to the heating team uh, we've got four people look at that and we get a lot of emails every day but it means we can distribute it a bit easier so if you have any take absolutely send yeah. them and uh, don't mind no problem at all we'll, we'll get through them yeah all. no the, the, there are as I said there are a few more so <clears throat> you get through them there's just some they're very yeah. significant they would take a while for for yeah. e true so uh, a big thank you to ian for his presentation today i, I think it, it was really good um i mean dykin are a fantastic company and products so I, I i certainly got something out of it thank you thanks for that ian um, I'm sure everybody else agrees with that as well. Um, just a reminder, and I suppose we're we're, we're still moving on with, with the, the rest of our, our webinars uh, and our seminars on, from the various other people involved in the EEBS. So coming up, um, let me see, week three, we have Windows with um, uh, Nordan. So next Tuesday, we'll have uh, looking at some windows, identifying the wood from the trees. Um, uh, Thursday, we're gonna have timber frame structures with a Harmony Timber Frame. So just, you know, you, you all have the links, so please feel free to come along for those. 
And then we have our final week, week four coming up after that, along with our, our final plenary session. So please come along and hopefully, you know, we, we reach out to the people that are involved and hopefully everybody can learn something. All the CPD sessions as we go on, they are, they are being recorded, every single one of them. And links will be sent out and they are available. So everybody is welcome to join in with those. But um, reach out to the people that are involved in these sessions if you need further details. But other than that, thanks everybody for coming along today. Um, and thanks to Ian again. Very, very good information. And, and I, I, again, as I said earlier on, I, st I still learn something new every time. So that's really good. So thanks, thanks everybody. Andrew. And hopefully we see you all again soon. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks indeed. Bye-bye yeah. now. Bye-bye.